जोरदार तालियों से स्वागत हमारी गेस्ट ऑफ ऑनर नमस्ते I would like to acknowledge the External Affairs Minister Dr J Shankar for his invitation to present today. I feel very privileged to be here. I acknowledge the Honorable Shri Shivraj Singh Shankar Chief Minister Mantra Pradesh for hosting us in this beautiful state. I'd like to thank the Minister for Youth Affairs the Honorable Rag Singh Bakua I thank him for the opportunity to be here to address the youth plenary session. And to his excellency Prime Minister Narendra Modi, it is a great honor to be back here in incredible India. Australia's relationship has never been closer. The Indian community is our fastest growing diaspora and our nations have shared interests, challenges, perspectives and a strong belief in democracy. I know that my Australian Prime Minister, the Honourable Anthony Albanese, is looking forward to visiting India later this year. India for me is a kaleidoscope of colours, culture and senses. I was 15 years old when I first travelled to India. Honestly, I felt trepidatious and was unsure what to expect. There were several impressions that India gave me. The first, my extended family had so much love to give even though I lived overseas. We are close and my Indian cousin Noel has traveled um to join me here. My dad has an incredible work ethic, but then I understood that this is a shared trait of my whole extended family, but really the Indian diaspora. There is so much vibrancy and color here whether that be the clothes we wear or the food we eat. Finally, I remember the strength the kindness strangers gave me just because of my grandmother's reputation for Lisa dad as a kind and giving woman. India is a diverse country. The sleepy backwaters of Kerala represent an aquatic paradise. The desert skies of Gujarat offer glittering star-spangled skies, or here in Indore, the street food here is a flavor sensation as I learnt last night. And for me as a Goan, it's famous for its New Year Eve parties, but for Goans, we start the new year by going to midnight mass. India's diversity is what makes this country seem like it's contradictory. but rather i like to think of it a as a country that has duality two opposite parts that coexist i think it's this duality that helps the indian diaspora be so successful mixing old ideas is not new or unfamiliar concept to india india is arguably one of the most successful nations who practices ancient religions while embracing new technologies and boasting cities like bengaluru and its own thriving movie industry duality happens on a national level but i think it happens on an individual le level too minister thakur showed this by speaking in both hindi and english seamlessly as we the indian diaspora seek to do great things around the world we fall in love with other countries and create new lives and worlds for our family we then get to blend the best aspects of indian culture with the best aspects of another country and essentially we create a third culture following this i'd like to talk about some members of the australian indian diaspora who are at the forefront of innovation and new technologies aj prakash had the vision to empower a billion people to discover meaningful work through his education startup called entry level he is one of australia's top 100 innovators and is a forbes under 30 entrepreneur aj's platform delivers short intensive affordable programs with professional mentors from companies including Atlassian, Wise and Startmate. Recognizing that almost 200 million jobs were lost during 2020, largely due to COVID, AJ wanted to think about ways to reskill people 
AJ's ambitious goal is to prevent mass unemployment by 2030. The thing that I find particularly refreshing about AJ is that he openly talks about failing. Culturally, this is something that I think many of us would struggle with. However, smart entrepreneurial culture has taught me that it's smart to fail fast and fail small to crack the, open the next innovation. Then there's Veena Shawajala, who's a material scientist, engineer, and inventor. She's the recipient of the Pravasi Bharataya Samam. She is passionate about waste. She was talking about green steel production before it was cool. She thought that it would be smart to use end-of-life tyres to replace coal and coke in steel making. The Pulitzer Prize winning author Charles Duhigg told us that innovation happens by mixing old ideas in new ways. Well, Vina was literally doing this by diverting almost 200 million tyres from landfill and then using them in the furnace during steel production. This reduces costs and reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Talking about net zero emissions, that's quite an accepted term worldwide. In time, we will talk about net zero waste, aka the circular economy. So for manufacturers in the audience, I ask, can your products be repaired or even better? Can they be upgraded or retrofitted? And once your product it reaches the end of its life, can it be recycled or repurposed? The final person I'll talk about is an engineer from Australia who works, has worked in climate change the last 12 years. Her dad, Jose, an Indian metal worker, wanted to migrate from Kenya to Australia. Australia had a skill shortage. However, the Australian embassy explained to Jose that he had the right skills but had the wrong colour skin. Back then, the White Australia policy existed. Eventually, successive Australian governments dismantled this policy and Jose migrated to Australia with his wife and daughter. They lived in a multicultural mining town called Cambelda, where all cultures were celebrated. His youngest daughter was born in Australia and studied engineering and worked on the mines. She had a passionate and worked in climate change action for 12 years. She helped large companies reduce their carbon footprint. She loved her work and became the team leader. The policy environment was tough. In Western Australia, there are currently floods in the north, while in the south there are bushfire warnings. I am sure that we would all agree that climate change is wreaking havoc across the world. Action by the parliament was required. She was asked if she would run in the federal election to become a member of parliament. She was a mum of a two and a five year old. Federal politicians in Australia are required to be in Canberra, the capital, for almost half the year. The person I describe above is me. This is where I will share that my husband is my biggest supporter. He believed that I could win and make a positive difference in Australia. But equally, he was not daunted on needing to lead parent alone for half the year. Having a supportive partner is invaluable. When deciding on whether to run or not, I reflected on my family's history and recognised that politics can be personal, powerful and transformative. My Australian story would not be possible if it wasn't for the Australian government wanting to become the world's most successful multicultural nation. And in the end, I decided to do what mattered. Last year, Australia voted to change the government. So how on earth did I get elected up? Well, we all know that Indians in the Indian diaspora have a tremendous work ethic. And as the minister explained before, we have an unflinching spirit. My team and I knocked on 45,000 doors. For the first time in five terms, I won the seat of Swan. I became the first woman and the first person of colour to be elected to that seat in its 101 history. I can't tell you why I definitively won. One strong factor is the character of the new Australian Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, 
that authentic leadership matters. But I also think that my electorate wanted to have more diversity in Parliament, not just gender or ethnic background, but my skill set too. My electorate loved that I am a working mum and engineer. I want to leave you with this thought. The Indian diaspora combines two cultures to create a third culture with the best of both worlds. I encourage you to do what matters. And going further, you should think about your legacy. I reflect on my grandmother's, Felisa Dad's, tremendous legacy. She passed away 29 years ago yesterday. And even though I never met her, her presence was always feltly, felt strongly, long after she left our earth. So I'd like to ask you, what will your legacy be?